welcome. Welcome to our conference, Climate Justice and Feminism. It's our first conference we organized um, as we, we are the Institute of Environmental Justice, um, where we are sponsored by the uh, by Engagement Global, Brot für die Welt, and Stiftung Umwelt und Entwicklung. And normally we just do like normal panels and this time we try to make a conference. Um, and so this is our, well, our startup panel, our evening panel, Friday evening, and tomorrow we will have some uh, different workshops and also like an end panel. So, and if you want to have more information, you can go on climatefeminism.org and there you can see the full program and when to join and also where to, uh, where you can see our, our panels and our workshops. So um, now I would love to welcome our guests to our first panel. And the name of our panel is like Climate Justice and Feminism, One Struggle, One Fight, question mark. Um, because well, One Struggle, One Fight, that's our slogan. Uh, but maybe there are, there's like, there are different struggles we have to, um, we have to fight. And so I think it's important also to talk about that. And for that, we have um, international guests, um, as well as local activists from Germany um, brought together. And right now with us, are, um, like the first I want to welcome is Isadora Cardoso, who was born, was born in Brazil and works with Gender CC. Woman for Climate Justice in Germany. Maybe you can wave so the people know. <laughs> and uh, she enjoys intersectional feminism, climate justice, and decolonized ideas and practices. And implements do's in her lives through studios, activism, and works. Studies, sorry. <laughs> Then I would love to welcome Stephanie. Um, she is, you can wave. Um, she's a healthcare activist and a sixth year medical student. In different networks, she focused her work on the intersections between climate change, health and racial gender, as well as social injustice. And also with us is Lara, Lara. <laughs> And well, you are part of the Disobedient Climate Action Network and the Gelände uh, since 2016, who is blocking coal mines. And um, you also have to organize the first so-called feminist finger of Ende Gelände. Um, you're also involved in the struggle to save the Danröder Wald. Um, and you have started a feminist cycling group in Berlin. So we have like uh, three different women from three different regions and backgrounds brought together. And in a little while also will join us uh, two other women. So hello. Um, you're from the Philippines, a global activist. And yeah, well, you joined the movement after experiencing the devastation of the typhoon Haiyan in 2013 and became a climate and environmental advocate. And also you are, which I think it's a really cool thing to do, is you are one of the founder of the Youth Leaders Environmental Action Federation. So welcome to our panel, Climate Justice and Feminism. So we are here with different time zones uh, from different regions, um, but I think we will all come together today, to this evening, or morning, or afternoon, or really late evening. And uh, if it's okay, I would like to start with my first round, um, because we prepared some questions. And the first round, I would love, well, I would start a little, diff little bit different. I would start with telling stories about patriarchy and the climate crisis and what our experience are 
because what helps me a lot was when I learned that I'm not the only one having this kind of problems in my daily uh, life, in my work, and also like in the climate justice movement. And so I would love to start with like breaking the ice, sharing some stories of our experience can be like different stories. Um, and well, maybe Lara, because uh, I know you since I think some years. <laughs> and maybe uh, if, if it's okay, I would love to, to start to ask you if you would love to uh, share a question. Well, maybe I can share how Anne Glenda started to like talk and think about feminism like more. I think it was in um, like we did this actions of civil disobedience in 2015 for the first time where I wasn't even there. I think Katrin was there. Um, and then in 2016 and it was um, like from media perspective really successful. But then in uh, 2017, in the beginning of the year, there were some um, activists from Denmark, um, like a feminist group, and they came up like to to people from Endeglan and said, "Okay, um, we're a feminist group, and of course we care about the climate and environment, and we joined your actions in the last two years, but um, we didn't really feel safe. It was like an environment where, like in this situation, where you, it's also can sometimes like." Um, you're confronted with with the police, and you're you have to run, and you have to get into this open uh, open my uh, coal pit um, to stop the diggers, and it's it's a really like, empowering situation for most people, but it's also like a lot of adrenaline involved. And they said, okay, we want to come again as a like feminist group because we 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 think it's a like very important struggle, but we also want to feel safe. We don't want to like have guys around who shout at us we don't want to hear like people saying to us oh no we need other people to go in the front because like you're just too small we need like big tall guys who be in the front line uh, first line when we like break through the police lines and we want to participate as feminists and with our feminist ideals and can we like talk about it and think about how we can combine it and still like be disobedient, but in an inc inclusive and feminist way. And I think it was super important that they came up to us and like raised this issue. And then we sat down and like started to talk a lot and think a, a, a lot about how can we make our actions of civil disobedience like more feminist. And it's an like ongoing process of course, but it started a lot of like, do we really have to run? Is it like important to reach like the, the digger, for example, the coal digger that we run? Or isn't it better to like go all together at the same time? And who has to be like in the front? Is it really important that it's like big, tall guys or can it be like everybody? Mm, so like combining these things so that in the end, people don't have to decide, okay, am I a climate activist or am I feminist or am I like um, anti-racist activist, but that it can be like, that you can be everything and you have a like a place for activism where everybody feels safe. I mean, this is what we try to do. And of course it's like way far from perfect, but um, yeah. I think that's that that's what like what I like most about our activism actually that it's that we try to include more and more people and um yeah overcome our own stereotypes in a way yeah and it, I'm still so grateful for these feminists from Denmark who came up and said okay this can't be the only way can we do it differently yeah thank you so um before we uh um, going to the next, I would love to welcome Hilda into the group who just joined. Um, welcome to our panel. Um, and for those who don't know Hilda, she is one of the founder of um, Fridays for Future Uganda. And she's also a campaigner for protecting the Uguma forest in Uganda, who is under threat. And she also leads a lakeshore cleanup activity in Lake Victoria 
to beat plastic pollution. And welcome to our groups, in, uh, to our panel. And we are just uh, in the first round where we just share stories about, um, well, um, feminist and climate justice or climate justice and patriarchy. <laughs> so just to break the ice, um, because I think we all have like so many stories to tell why this is an important topic we have to talk about. Um, so is there someone who also wants to share like a story, something that happens or what are your first experience with the topic? I think I can relate to what Lada said earlier today. So it already starts in the small things and it's really impressive that a movement which is supposed to be open and supposed to be aware of these kind of structures always tends to go the other way around, even though they are fully aware of that or even though we think that we have these topics in our mind. So it already starts with the small things like also who is talking to who and also this, this kind of structures we feel in uh, not only in the activist movement, but also in academia in, and also the people we, we go to when we, when we uh, are connecting each other. So it starts with the small things like the way I dress which they think is not appropriate enough or it's not professional or it's not, um, it's not like in their style as well. The way pe women speak, maybe they have another language which is not as, as objective or like highly eloquent um, than the man's language which is supposed to be like super high professional and objective and everything which is like kind of emotional already gets cornered into this like yeah this is a woman this is um not to be taken seriously so i think this is also like intersects with a lot of classist issues and racist issues people have in their minds and also then also men taking up the space, retelling your own stories, um, this kind of mansplaining, uh, which also happens a lot of time. And it made me personally feel small, made me question myself, made me question the room I take in spaces. And women in the society, I think, um, are thought to to have low self-esteem, have low self-confidence. This is actually in studies that shows that women having this feeling tend to not go into political places and into a, a political arguments. So this is actually something which I really needed to learn to say, hey, don't let yourself get down. Don't uh, let people take up your space. It's okay to take up space and your perspective has value and is of importance. And it's actually up to us to take up the space as well, but also to, to the structures to make us feel comfortable as Lala said. So I think this is at both points, something we have to learn. Thank you for sharing, it was beautiful. Um, so does anyone else wants to share a story for the beginning or shall we move on? I can quickly share something as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just trying to remember some story because I think uh, we all can have many stories in our lives where we were confronted with uh, very misogynistic or uh, patriarchal ways of uh, treating normally women um, in a society in, anywhere in the world. So, but uh, one specific um, um, situations which happened to me last year uh, in the climate conference, because we work within those, within those spaces, which are not really like spaces for movements, but a lot of our movements take those spaces as well to advance our, 
our um, demands for climate justice. I remember last year we, um, I was invited to talk on a panel on, on women or young women um, doing, um, yeah, advancing climate agendas in the global, from the global south. And I was really prepared for the, for the panel to talk about it, like technically how we're doing, like how we're advancing our demands there in the region. And, uh, but the first thing that um, we started talking, like the people started talking in the panel was actually was super strong because uh, it was a, um, one person started sharing her um, stories of, um, of abuse during um, her life. And then the next one also shared. And that moment was just a moment that when everyone in the panel, which were, which were all um, women or LGBT people, um, everyone in the panels had a similar story. And I was like, wow, this is so impressive. And we know more and more that this is, that this is such an unfortunate thing, that it's such a, um, um, a thing that happened to so many people. Uh, so many women, so many um, LGBT people, and that connected us in a way which was which was very um, um, strong, very also um, emotive. But in a, it was also very important. It gave us a lot of power to tell the story about how we became climate activists and how we and why we fight for the causes that we um, that we want to advance in the world. So. That was very so. Sharing is indeed one of the things that I that I think are very empowering in the feminist uh, in the feminist building of you know of what we are. And this can be a climate activist. This can be so many things, as Lara said. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really true. So, um, I would. Then um, go to my next question, um, because now, well, we we said that there is like this, the same injustice underneath um, our stories and our life. Um, but I also want to ask, are we sitting in the same boat? And Stephanie, um, if it's okay, I would love to give this question to you. This is kind of sounding like a fairy tale to, uh, to be honest, like to be sitting in the same boat because we all have our own histories. We all have our own different backgrounds, but especially concerning climate change and um, the feminist perspective on that, we have to see that the people in the global South suffer the most and it's not somewhere in the future, it's happening right now. Um, as this is also not only a matter of what are the emissions right now, but also historically speaking, that um, the people in the global north have so much responsibility uh, for the emissions which cause the climate crisis we face right now. So we can say that 10% of the richest people in the world cause up to 50% um, of the global emissions. And 50% of the poorest people actually cause like about 10% of the global emissions, which is really not unfair and shows us that we are actually not on the same boat, especially for concerning women, which pose even now a marginalized group in our society. And especially in the global south, it's that extreme weather events like floods, wildfire, storms cause that men are, and actually women are killed disproportionately more by these events because they're not included into the security nets. For example, men who go to work every day and are in the security nets there, the women are taking care of children and elderly, and therefore they are not into the security nets. And they also, um, and especially women of younger age, get killed more by these weather events. Then for, for the other health perspective, I have to say that the indirect effects um, of 
climate catastrophes like this have more more reasons to um, have an actual uh, cause on the life of women. For example, the um, ability and the the um, to to find drinking water is actually a job of women in all of these countries. They have to go farther to find the water and actually this poses them into dangerous situations and also, um, also only finding a place to go to the toilet already poses a danger when their homes are destroyed and actually um, all these factors, and also not only in the global south, but also in the global north, we see here that, for example, after a catastrophe like Hurricane Katrina in 2005 in the States caused a, the double of um, domestic violence um, events in, these, in, in the United States, and also collecting water for like hundreds of kilometers or um, searching for a safe place to go to the toilet is actually posing the women in danger in their bodies. So the climate catastrophe is not only exploiting the planet, but also exploiting women's bodies. And I could go way further than that, but I think for now, I would stop with these kind of uh, these examples. Thank you. Um, so my next question then would be directly to Hilda. My question to you uh, would be now um, uh, because well we today we had like this huge protest for the 1.5 degree target also in Berlin. And um, well, but at the same time in Germany, there are also voices from the government and also from the economy who are criticizing this one point degree target as impossible to reach and also as a threat to the prosperity in Germany. And so I wanted to ask you what, what's your op opinion about that and What would you would say to the German, German government and also to the companies who think that the 1.5 degree target um, is impossible to reach or should not be um, considered as? Well, for me, you know, in development, you always have to compromise, right? And that is also true with the our environment uh, so that we could um, we could protect more people we can um, we can save more people we have to make compromises and that is I mean development should not just be about uh, having profits it's not just about uh, um, getting more of like uh, more money or profits it's also if we will just think about how impossible it is then we will not do it i mean there will be no way that we could go further with this fight actually because in this fight we always have to make compromises and that compromises is very worth it because it could save lives it could save people from the other side of the world And if we would just think that it is too much, um, I mean, I could understand that they feel like, I mean, it is already their privileges and reaching that 1.5, like limiting that 1.5 um, degrees Celsius for to, to really, to really, um, to really like comply with the Paris Agreement can, it, I mean, it could be too much, especially if they're not willing to do the compromises. But in this fight, you always have to think of the lives of other people, of who are you, who are you saving, saving, because we always have to make compromises. And for the people in Germany, I know you can do so much and, And you can always push your government to do more. 
um, to always uh, demand accountability from them because um, the first world country may not be experiencing um, now the effect of climate change, but in the future, it, it may not experience, it may not, uh, you may not experience it directly now, but it is already happening and it can affect you in any aspect of your life. And if we will not do now, if we will do something now, if we will just wait for other countries to do it, then I don't think that we will actually hit the target because each country, each of us has to do something in order to get or to reach that, um, to reach that target. Yeah. So um, I would love to have like a follow-up question. Uh, if that's okay. Um, so what would be like your main demands uh, to countries like like Germany? If you could like tell them concrete what we should do, um, are there something you, you would love to tell them? Uh, there is so many things that I want to tell them. First, always, um, if they could just stop funding coal and go to renewable, and if they could just uh, um, support or fund those vulnerable countries to make more um, proactive, you know, infrastructures like infra proactive measures, um, like infrastructures, in order we could we could also like mitigate the impacts of climate change because like in the Philippines, we're already suffering the effects of climate change. We're dealing um, the effects every day of our lives. And we are always uh, like, we are always, we are always worrying about the, our livelihood, about our house, if we will have a house at the end of the year. And if we are, we, where are we going to go when there will be a disaster? So if there could be a great proactive measure that people would not be um, worrying if their houses is already is still there when there is a disaster. I mean, like first world countries can fund the vulnerable countries so that we could adapt more measures and to mitigate the effects of climate change. So I would ask them to stop funding coal in Germany and outside Germany, and also start funding um, vulnerable countries to have more proactive measures to mitigate and adapt climate change. Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Hilda, can you, um, do you have a better connection? Can you hear us? Um, five years ago, the Paris Agreement was created. It was like a time before Fridays for Future. And I know that you attended the last UN Climate Conference in Madrid one year ago. Um, why was it important for you to attend? And what are your demands to the UN Climate Conference as well as to, to us in the countries of the Global North? Thank you so much. I hope I am clear now. Well, I, last year I attended COP25, which was in Madrid. And to me, it was the first COP to attend as a person and as a climate activist. And I had very high hopes of this COP because to me, this was the biggest climate conference that uh, can happen in the world. And I had so much hope that it will yield a lot of um, like hope, a lot of climate action, get our leaders to act. But uh, last year was also the COP that committed the year of action, but it is also a COP that failed us. Um, all, it was all about talks, ambitions, talks, um, exaggerated ambitions, but there was nothing like action. Um, first of all, I was happy to attend because um, I was among the few young people who was invited uh, for this global conference and also from the global south because in most cases, we people who are mostly affected, we are 
always underrepresented, especially for such conferences. And in big conferences, it's always government officials who appear. And of course, they follow the large sums of payments that come with it. And in most cases, people who are mostly affected do not represent. And I came, I, I came to represent uh, millions of young people who are bearing the brunt of the climate crisis. And as also there to speak for all generations to come, because to us, what matters is the things around us, the environment around us, birds, fish, um, uh, animals, forests, all these things to us Africans count, but to other people they might not count, but I was there to make these people aware that these things to us count, they might not make, they might not count to them, but at least should make us people count. And while I was there, my country was experiencing massive uh, weather events that were killing people, disasters like landslides, floods in the east, and people were dying. And I was trying to stress this emergency that was happening in my country, but uh, few people or nobody at all understood what we were talking about. And as a voice from the global south, I always communicate that uh, women and children will always suffer most. I know that everyone will suffer the events of climate change, but women and children are on the front lines. They suffer the most from this unsafe climate. And this climate is created by rich countries, countries in the global north that keep on funding these fossil fuel industries, that keep on uh, the coal mines, that keep doing all these things, but they had to understand that we are humans who do not deserve to be treated like that, who do not deserve to suffer a crisis that we did not create. And I, speak, I spoke boldly about um, the British because my country, Uganda, was colonized by the British. And by the time they named my country the Pearl of Africa because of the nature and the beauty that was around it. But um, I told them that if those people or if the British were to come back to my country right now and look at whatever is going on, they wouldn't call it uh, the Pearl of Africa again. They would have uh, totally different ideas. And this means um, everything like our forests are gone, wildlife is attacked, uh, fish is killed, everything is disappearing. Species are disappearing at a very high rate. So this climate injustice as a person or as an individual, as a, as a woman and as an activist in the global South is an injustice that made me to risk my education, to always miss my classes every Friday and strike for climate justice this involves going to the streets and asking for asking for climate justice from our leaders and not only our leaders but also corporate organizations and individuals who have a say or uh, like people like policy makers so this climate injustice forced me to risk my education and i will always do this for that for the good of the future generations. We do not really have a decision to make because this is the only way for us to get a brighter future, to get a better future. We have to fight for it. And um, like I was saying at COP25, uh, it marked 25 years of meetings and negotiations, negotiations behind our backs. We couldn't say anything but we are hopeful and that's why we keep fighting on the streets. So last year was um, a bit uh, disappointing, actually not a bit, but it was disappointing mm -hmm. to us who attended, especially uh, the youth and the climate activists because we had 
our hopes very high. Our hopes were really high, but they were all um, overshadowed. They were all um, they were all turned down. And um, I would say that uh, leaders uh, we need leadership on climate action. We no longer need talks about climate change right now. We need concrete actions because these leaders have been negotiating for the last 25 years and there's really no action at all. So we demand that leaders come up and take more ambitious climate actions. And that is why uh, this week we are fighting uh, for 1.5, 1.5 degrees Celsius because if we do not fight for it, then we won't have it. I mean, this is our future. It's, it's our life. We have to fight for it. Leaders are continuing to fail us and we can't sit on or we can't keep on watching. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, my next question would be go directly to Isadora because I know you are sometimes really deep in the negotiations of inside the UN Climate Conference. And um, so, because uh, often we talk about system change and then we talk about the economy, but I also would love to talk about uh, the power structure in our decision-making stru uh, structures. And uh, right now we just hear two strong messages about the urgency of the climate crisis and also concrete suggestion of what should be done. And why do their demands not match the reality of the climate policy, for example, at the UN climate negotiations? So where's the problem there? Um, thanks for the question, Katrin. Um, I think there are so many problems about those spaces, um, it is such a problematic space, first of all, because it's so inaccessible, so difficult to travel, so um, people cannot just go and observe. You have to go through a long process to get an observer status. So it is highly inaccessible. And therefore by that, I can already, you can already presume that those negotiations are also very not representative of the populations of the, so the delegations, the countries that go there, the delegations are normally super uh, unequal in terms of gender balance, in terms of race, racial balance, in terms of so many balances that um, should have, because in a society we have so much diversity, but when, when we see the delegations of the countries, it's may, mainly, um, yeah, it's mainly, we can see uh, male dominated um, delegations in most of the cases. So this is, I think the very first thing that one goes there, a feminist person goes there and see is the lack of representation of that space. And especially it gets higher, the more, um, the more you go up in the decision-making, um, let's say power that those, that those delegations have. So um, the heads of delegations, the people who have uh, the final says in each of the topics that are discussed, the higher you go, the more you see uh, this pattern that we see also in other uh, sectors, right? So male dominated decision makers. So the lack of rep representation, I think it's a big, big problem. And that's why um, policies which are decided in the global level on climate change still are failing to um, to really um, make or take up the, 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 the demands that people are, 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 are voicing, voicing on the streets, that people are, are asking for, for years, for decades. So it's 25 years and still we haven't really achieved much. And it's still, uh, the lack of representation is a big problem. But I also think that, um, the whole system is also very much um, focused on technical fixes and technical solutions for a, for a problem that we know climate change is not a is not a technical thing. It's not a thing that you resolve with you know simply 
thinking about reducing emissions. No, I mean, this is impacting people, this is impacting bodies, this is impacting um, um, also other species, you know? So we have to have a very like comprehensive understanding of the, the pros of the, 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 of climate change. And therefore we cannot solve this such a big issue with only technical and um, let's say, I don't know, environmental um, experts. We need indigenous peoples bringing on their traditional knowledge, which is which we know are many times much more eff efficient to um, to solve the climate imbalances that we observe throughout the world. We need those peoples there. So we need traditional knowledge. We need women's knowledge. We need knowledge from people who are marginalized, who were more historically marginalized, and and this is a matter of also reparation, historical reparation. So, and there are a few steps uh, that we can see um, in the last years, especially uh, in the climate negotiations um, in terms of including those voices and those solutions for, for thinking of climate change uh, and the solutions to climate change from a broader perspective, um, such as, for example, the in, there is an indigenous peoples uh, and local communities platform, which was created recently. And the idea is exactly to bring indigenous peoples and, and local communities from all around the world to share their traditional knowledge and how they are dealing locally with, you know, what we call nowadays climate change. How these people have been like resisting colonization and the devastation that that Europe and other colonizers have brought to the world like for centuries. So it's um, there is this space, for example, at being developed in the, in the climate negotiations. And I think it's very, very interesting to see uh, what, what the solutions and the, the, that, that uh, the indigenous peoples are sharing there, you know? Um, but still, um, I would say that most of the decisions are taken very, um, yeah, not democratically, and this is obvious because of the reasons that I that I also said here, and um, yeah, and therefore they they fail to represent what people are asking, and they fail to represent especially what also the the to acknowledge the responsibilities that the most powerful people have. Uh, it's very comfortable to just keep living like, yeah, as if there were no responsibilities. So these are a few problems that I can identify, but there are so many, and uh, I will just leave more time for the discussion later. Okay. Uh, but I have like a short follow-up question, um, because you're also involved in the gender action plan. And I think it is also something no, most people don't know about, that this gender action plan does exist. And can you, Tell us more about it and why was it so important to fight for it? Yes, so we are also part, um, so the organization where I work with and also when we go to the negotiations, we are part of a larger group of a large, ad, larger advocacy group, uh, which is the women and gender constituency. And we basically try to advance the, the let's say the feminist uh, ideas in the negotiations. We are from many parts of the world and uh, and then, um, yeah, and it's been it's been since 2014 we had uh, the first, let's say, broader gender decision, which was a very great um, achievement for us because we've been um, fighting for you know gender and gender equality to be uh, included in the climate decisions uh, holistically in all its processes and not only as a standalone thing like hey, gender is a matter of like something in separate or something only related to gender balance. So we've been fighting for this for many decades, but it was in 2014 when the, for the Lima Work Program came and then um, the first gender action plan in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah, it's a really important, um, uh, let's say, uh, mark in, in the struggle of this feminist group because it's a bold plan with actions and concrete activities that basically say to the countries which are part of the climate convention that they need to mainstream gender, that they need to consider gender balance in their delegations, that they need to fund women from the global side, 
from the global south, indigenous women to go to the negotiations. So very concrete actions that have been, let's say, um, set to be implemented since 2017. And the countries have this, have this very bold policy and they have to, now I think still there is a lot of question on how to implement that, but I would say that there is a, this is a very important um, policy that can guide government and also some civil society to act on how to have a, you know, a climate just and also a gender just uh, approach to, to the solutions to climate change. So yeah, it's called the gender action plan and it's also online. So in, uh, everyone working with policy and also like advocacy, I think it's a very important policy mechanism. Thank you for telling us. So my next question would be to Lara, because well, we just heard how uh, women are connecti connecting globally to fight for a project like the gender action plan, uh, like for policies. And so in Germany, we also have like the same problem, like Isadora just told us about that we have a very uh, technique orientated way to discuss the climate crisis. And um, so how can, how, how should we also change in Germany our discussion? And should we also like uh, talk and act more um, connecting the struggles in issue of race, gender and social justice? Uh, yeah, thank you. First of all, I want to briefly say something about this um are we all sitting in the same boat because i think when we talk about feminism on the one hand side and i'm super happy that we're all here together now in this uh, digital room and it's really important that we say okay we're a global feminist movement um and we're like in solidarity with each other but of course it's also important to point out that we as women or around the world or as feminists around the world we're also not in the same boat so of course I'm sitting here in Germany, I'm trying like being a good feminist for me also means that I keep in mind that there are people way more affected by the climate crisis, way less responsible and to make those voices heard. Um, yeah, and I mean, sometimes there's this feminist discourse of all women just have to, I'm sorry, um, Berlin is a bit loud. Um, all women have to like take up space and be empowered. And of course, if I'm, in a room with like other guys from Berlin, then it's my kind of right to take a lot of space. But it's also important as a like white privileged person to like leave space for others. I mean, this is like what inter intersectional feminism is about. I just wanted to make that point quickly. Um, and then coming to your question, um, I mean, I think. There's so much happening also with Fridays for Future, um, at least here in Germany, I see so many really young and really great girls, women, whatever um, there. And also just today I was at the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin where they set up this fight for 1.5 um, sign with lights and it was in a really like um, nothing special about it way that there was like I was asking for like who can give me like a short statement for a video for the NGO that I work for and um, I was I was said okay this it's this girl she's doing it for the first time but you can ask her and there was just like a guy standing next to her and supporting her and asking other journalists um, if they want interviews and they weren't really like making a big deal about it it was just like a really normal thing that she would do it for the first time and the, the guy who did it before was like helping her and keeping her back kind of like um, and I think in a way a lot has happened um, but of course it's still and it's a, it's like the cop the higher you go up in the uh, policy levels or in the hierarchies then the more difficult it is and you get this like really technical discourse and I was talking to the amazing Tony Noshwin the other day about this 1.5 target um, goal. I mean, it's not a goal, it's like a <laughs> threshold or something. And she said that it's also a bit dangerous to just make it about numbers all the time, because then you're again in this technical discourse with ha which has been shaped with a patriarchal again agenda of making it um, a technical problem that you can solve with technical solutions. And that, of course, it's really important to 
always make this point that we cannot go higher than 1.5. But at the same time, we need a new discourse still in Germany also, I think everywhere, to make it more about people and make it more about the people who, whose lives are already threatening by climate crisis um, and make it less like... Because, I mean, when I listen to the uh, like media discourse or within the NGO discourse about climate change, it's a lot about, okay, should it be 1.5 or 2 degrees and what's more reasonable? And... It's not about, okay, how many more people will die if we don't stick to the 1.5 uh, degree thing, if we go out to two degrees, how many people will lose their families, will lose their houses, um, will lose their lives. This is not what we talk about. It's, and when you bring it up, then it's always like, okay, but be rational or, yeah, this, this thing is, is still going on. And of course, it's not so easy to say, okay, we just need more women in all the important places and then it will be better but we also need um, another way of talking about it so we have both both things at the same time kind of um, thank you so much so i have like a quick follow-up question because uh, for me it's also like um, interesting to know um inside the climate justice movement in germany are there some changes that we not only talk about feminists, but also about uh, how can we be more diverse? How can we make voices more heard? I think in this point, it's like really interesting. Maybe it's in other, in other contexts, it's similar. But I think this discussion about feminism that I mentioned before, it was kind of a door opener for other topics as well. And now it's a lot um, about how can we be more like how can we be less white how can we be more open to uh, like people that are not from this like only white privileged academic background and um, how can we um, tackle these internalized racism uh, problems that are also in the in the climate movement movement um, and it's an it's ongoing I think um, but There's way more awareness and um, especially with, with Ende Gelände, we talk about it um, a lot. It's, yeah, I'm still thinking about um, how we can make it more, like, how, ca how can we make it more visible? Because uh, a lot of things are going like happening in conversations and be in between people and we have, like, um, self-reflection and um, workshops about it and it's it's great but I think a lot of BIPOC people or people with migrant backgrounds in Germany they still think the climate justice movement is not a space where they can they can feel safe and um, they have good reasons to think so I think and I'm still wondering or asking myself how can we change this But of course, a lot of things have to happen um, like inside first and we have to like get less racist and <laughs> reflect ourselves more before before we can actually invite like people to come. But it's at the same time, we need like um, people with di more diverse backgrounds to come and join the movement so that we get out of this trap of always talking with the same white people of how can we be like less white. Um, so yeah, but I'm thinking about how we can like be more open or like show show to more people that we would love to welcome them and work with them. Um, but it's yeah, I think it's especially important because next year we have elections in Germany, and it looks like there is the possibility for a coalition between the Conservative Party and the Green Party. And what happened in Austria when they had the same coalition was that it was actually um, kind of a trade-off thing of, okay, we protect the climate more, but we also protect our borders more. And then there was a lot of like racist policies um, and the Green Party accepted, in Austria, the Green Party accepted that. And on the other hand, there was more like more strict climate protection laws. And I think it's really, really important for us as climate justice movement, I mean, climate justice movement, um, to point that out that you cannot trade one for the other and that it's it actually like 
goes really strongly together. But I don't really know what's the best way to do it. So <laughs> I'm still open for ideas. Thank you so much. Um, because Hilda, you are also like one of the founders of Files to Future Uganda. And I know that you are also an advocate for more diversity in the climate politics and also in the climate movement. Um, I would love to, to hear your opinion um, how, how we should take, um, well, how we as a movement can take on this huge problem of uh, how we can be more diverse as a movement and can make the voices of the global south more heard and not only us white people from the global north. Can you hear us? Yeah. It's a little bit like the, the same question I had like to Hilda, uh, because I would love to hear more opinion and voices because it's like really important for us to, to also not only talk about feminism, but also to how to connect the struggles uh, if that's possible. And so I would also wanted to ask your opinion um, how to move forward as a movement? I think it's a lot to for people. When I think about my community here, um, I think a lot about socioeconomic disparities, actually, which like differ from people who are in the climate justice movement right now. For example, when I would think about going to Endegelende, for example, then it's something very much to ask from BIPOC people. For example, the police repression they are facing, or also the also only the equipment. It's like going into actions is, um, and also having the time, the also. Um, maybe trauma they already have had in the past with the police. Um, so this again shows us that it's rather a systemic issue and we cannot, as you just said, Lala, I think, um, we cannot compare and like evaluate which crisis is like more um, like heavier to, to to get onto because like it's all it's all conflicted it's all like um, capitalism and colonialism kind of had the same source it all began like the climate crisis didn't begin like a lot of media say like oh yeah this is like the new climate movement but it didn't just begin with Fridays for Future it already began in the let's say 15th century with, when the first colonists were going to to enslave people in other countries so and since then they are fighting and but these voices are not heard and they are not seen as activists and this is something i, I feel very sad about and i think it's about giving these people platforms and really listening it's the first thing, I guess, listening to their problems, to their concerns, and also not only global north, global south, but on, also looking at each other, looking at our neighborhoods, and also looking at what kind of problems they face, because it's really a lot to think about the climate we already feel it with Corona that it's so it's so much in the air, but it's not like you can't grab it really. So people have really struggle and also have mental health issues, which we have to regard to um, concerning these issues when we talk about climate change. This is not something you can just like like talk about, and it's it's something not heavy. You know, like people already have trauma in them. So we should be also be very careful how we 
how we invite them into these spaces and um, yeah, really try to, to understand their struggles, I think. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, Hilda is with us again. Um, for me, it's felt like very interesting um, to know because I'm not part of Fridays for Future, but I know that you also have like this discourse about how to become more diverse. And in my opinion, I, I suggest that uh, we need to first change uh, the fundamental system. We need to change uh, our fundamental system. Until we have systems in place to protect the people and our planet, everyone is at risk. Yes, uh, most of the people at risk are those in the global south and the mostly affected, but also everyone that is on earth is at risk because the transition does not just have to be uh, faster, but it also has to be fair. Um, like, uh, like earlier said that 10% uh, of the rich, 10% uh, of the rich are responsible for 90% of the emissions. And this is already unfair and it's unjust and it's the system that is built it is this system that is unjust because we can not go back uh, to normal. Normal was already a crisis and this crisis is this inequality that we are facing right now that has the destruction of nature, the destruction of the climate. And we cannot uh, go back to this broken system. So uh, decision makers always uh, make these choices for us. Uh, like I said earlier, for the first 25 years, decisions have been made, but these decisions are not helping. They're just talks and empty premises. We need concrete action. Right now, more and more people are realizing that all the risks and injustices the world is experiencing have the same root causes. And this root cause is because of these selfish decisions that are made by our leaders. More and more people are starting to realize, and also this pandemic has uh, helped many people realize this, that what this Fridays for Future movement has is unity, because we cannot say that we want to change or we want a better world or we want climate justice without unity. There has to be unity at the core of each and everything that we do. This starts from the things we do, the activities we take, the decisions we take. They all have to be just, they have to be fair, and they have to all put people at the center of everything. We need to protect uh, people and planet. And the Fridays for Future movement is diverse in different parts of the countries, in different parts of the world. And it's this unity that brings us together so that we can work together. Um, I was saying that these decisions that are made by our leaders are what brought us here in this unjust system. This system was built with a lot of injustice and in order to uh, achieve climate justice, we have to change this system. And our leaders are not fighting for the well-being of the planet and its people. So that is why these Fridays for Future movements are committed to go on the streets, to strike, to campaign, to yell, uh, to build campaigns and form connections, to demand more action and to all also grow stronger and more powerful movements until there is uh, need, until, until the, our leaders are ready to fight with us and not against us. And right now we see that actually we've experienced that our leaders uh, make decisions according to their selfish gains. Uh, if it is a decision that will happen in 20 years, they are always ready to sign it immediately. 
But if it's about something to do right now, there always nowhere to be seen. So we need to change. Um, we need to change uh, our leaders. We need more ambitious leaders that have more concrete actions to take, but not leaders who are always uh, giving us promises, false promises, and always uh, talks. It is vital also for people who are uh, like decision makers for different countries to make decisive steps, which will help us grow into our, which will help us grow into more sustainable countries or more sustainable cities. This will help us move faster to realizing uh, climate justice. Thank you so much for sharing this for the technique. Um, and well, this is uh, also perfect for my next question, which was again to Marinel. Um, are you with us still? Um, yes, because... yes. <laughs> so, Sorry. You're one of the founder of the Youth Leaders Environmental Action Federation. Um, so, um, well, with Fridays for Future, we have like this, uh, this young movement um, of climate activists. And also, why is it so important that young people getting more involved and um, also um, how can, can we support them to get involved and why is it so, so important for you to work in, in this field to empower young people? It is so important that young people is on board on decision-making processes, especially if it involves them, if it involves their future. Because like, I truly believe that even children, if you're deciding for them for their future, you should always have a consultation with them on what they want that um like what do they want for themselves and it is just right that young people are actually on board in this kind of decision making processes because in 10 years and 25 years it is today's generation that will be um leading that will be um that will be managing you know it is the this generation who will be like uh, the next led leaders in 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. And I am just so happy that a lot of people, young people now are actually already aware of the social, um, of our problem, of our, um, of the problem, I mean, globally, like for like the climate crisis, because if we will talk about climate crisis, it, would surely affect the future of people like I myself I don't want I maybe said this already before but I don't want to be I don't I I still have so much dreams for myself I want to build a family I have to I want to have a child but then I don't want to, and also I have to reach some milestone in my career but I don't want that time will come that I will just be busy surviving typhoons or surviving climatic disasters because that is already a way of life and as a young as a young person i have to take action now so that i have this i can save my future and young like adults people who are like our guardians our parents you can always support us in doing this you can always motivate us to do more and that um and that like hold us back saying um, rallying is not doing any good, protesting is not doing any good because as whenever you say that to young people, you're just making them more disappointed of you because we will not be in the situation if, if the older generation have just done enough so that we will not be in this situation. And the youth are stepping up actually to take the responsibility. Of course, we cannot do it alone. We can, We always need support from the government, from our elders. We always need guidance. And you guys, like 
I mean, the older generation has the resources. I mean, I mean, the government has the resources. So there are so many organizations who, who have resources that can be used as a platform platform for the youth to realize projects and um, projects and programs for the environment. And this just this kind of support is already enough for us to maximize our voice, to maximize our action. Because like young people as we are, we always want to do more. We always want to reach more people and to be more inclusive and to um, reach as much as we can reach, you know. And also, I, I, am just, I am just really proud now of how young people are step, stepping up and how young people are fighting for what they believe in. Because coming from the Philippines, um, which is a conservative country, and rallying and protesting is stigmatized. I am happy that some of my peers are actually already awake, awakened of this kind of issues. And they're actually already posting or actually have a say on this kind of topics because they should have a say on this kind of topic because it is their future. It is our future. It is the next generation's future that is at stake if we will not do something now. We always say this, as cliche as it may be that if we will not do something, there, it might be too late. If we will not do something, it is our future that it is, that is at stake. However cliche it is, it is really true. And we should always do something. And we should always demand for accountability from our government and for those corporations who are fueling climate change, who are fueling, I mean, who are profiting from the suffering of other people. Thank you. And uh, so I would like to, um, to follow the, um, the direction you gave us because we have to act really fast right now. And, uh, but we also have to uh, face a pandemic. And um, in this time of pandemic, uh, which is another crisis, some governments, they can act fast. So Stephanie, um, because you are also um, it is, um, it is, um, sorry. Um, uh, so, so you are also like working in the field of health and uh, you are an expert on this topic. Um, and also you're like, you are all, already with your group, you're linking the problem of the climate crisis with the health issues. Um, so I would love to, to know from you. Um, so how can we learn from the pandemic in case of dealing with a crisis? And how should we prepare our health system to deal better with this kind of pandemics? And are there any links um, to how we should react to the climate crisis? So what can we learn from the, uh, from the situation um, right now, like bad or good decisions who are taken by the government or, and uh, the responsibility of the people yeah. Just, yeah, I'm having no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, uh, should I ask, answer it or Steph? Um, you, uh, I, I wanted to ask Steph, but I you also can can tell yeah. because I no, no, go go Steph. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> because maybe it's like really cool to know like two different opinions from different regions of the world. Because well, in Germany we have. Um, uh, we tackle the pandemic in a maybe in a different way than in the Philippines. Uh, so it would be like really interesting to hear both of you. But yeah, I would really like to to listen to you too, Marina, if you would like to talk to about it. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Steph. But anyway, I just I just thought that. Um, if we have just, you know, faced the climate crisis as the same urgent matter as COVID-19 before, we will, we sh will not be in this situation. Like, this is just one, um, one pandemic of many, maybe more pandemic if we will not address climate crisis. And we should not go back. There is always a narrative that 
um, I can't wait to go back to normal or I can't wait to get back to normal. But the normal was the problem. And if we will go back to normal, if we will go back to how it was before, then there will be no change. And I just thought that, you know, how we are being affected like climate change is a very is a very link to mental health climate change is a very link to other other health problem and if we will not do something now then it just show that the climate change really affects every aspect of our lives not just through typhoons not just through climate disasters but in 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 aspect like health mental health and other aspects of our lives and I just, uh, if we will not change our processes, if we will not change the way we are dealing things before, like uh, maybe this is not the last pandemic. I mean, I mean, there will be more if we will just keep on denying that climate change is real. Go Steph. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Like. It's true, like Corona shows us what, what we can do in order to tackle crisis. So um, we have seen huge measures being taken and also um, we see that we're still not over this. We, are not, we, are, we still don't have a hand on this crisis. Um, there are still people suffering more under the corona crisis than others do. So I want to come back into this picture of we are all not in the same boat. And actually corona shows us this, especially not only comparing the global north to the global south, but also the socioeconomic disparities we see. So um, in every country, not only in the global south or not only in the global north. So it's our job to highlight these. We have to see that not everybody is going into this crisis with the same resources. And especially talking about women, I think that these crises also pose a lot of danger to all the things women have achieved up until now, all the, the freedom, the possibilities. We see that not only in Germany, but in all over the world, the women are taking now much more on their backs, like doing the unpaid care work, uh, taking care of the children, um, also getting exploited by their work, which are mostly like less paid jobs, which are the backbone to our society, which for example, are the, the, the nurses, which are battling Corona in the first front rows. So, and especially seeing this, seeing the healthcare system um, more and more under pressure also of profits right now. Like, but when we see that health just as an intact climate is a human right and is not something which we can draw our profit from. So, which I th think is really interesting also comparing the corona crisis to the climate crisis is that, for example, the big pharmaceutical companies who present us right now with one solution to corona is also opposing to find a global solution for a global pandemic as they put against like, against the global north, against the global south, which like the global north has these resources to buy all these vaccines, but the global south then at the same time hasn't. And also there are now major setbacks on research on malaria, for example, because of corona. And this is not only problematic in this issue, but also concerning climate change, pharmaceutical companies are one of the biggest emitters on um, caused by the healthcare sector. So we really have to question these systems, just as Marinelle says, just as Hilda also mentioned, that these structures which seem so big, these systems, we need to change them. And uh, I think this is 
this is something which shows us very, like the corona crisis shows this very well. Thank you both so much for your uh, opinion. And so I also want like go directly then to Isadora uh, and to ask you, are you still with us? Perfect. So uh, now we heard also a lot about like system change is so urgent and um, but at the same time it's such a huge problem and such a huge thing to tackle and, uh, and very so where where are you starting or where should we where could we start <laughs> um, well to to start to well to tackle this issue of system change on to create an another system okay a difficult question <laughs> um, but I think um, it is um, yeah, maybe it's uh, starting from this acknowledgement that we've been talking here that um, climate change is something so complex and that affects um, people and uh, the planet and uh, all the systems that we live that we have in this in, in the planet ecosystems. Um, like directly so thinking about climate change as a very system in a systematic way. And therefore, that's why we need to see it as not only an environmental issue, as not only an economic issue, as not only a technical issue. I think it's the first thing to start, uh, yeah, the change in our minds on how to approach the issue of climate change. Um, and I think also one, one very important thing, and it's a very feminist um, claim, I would say, um, that Steph um, mentioned about, you know, care work and about um, the care economy, which is something that I think um, it is, it is uh, remarkable. And it, we see um, how the pandemic really put us all in a, in a, in a, in a, in very, like everyone is super tired of you know working because we are working. Many people are working from home. Many people who have, who work in the care sector, who work in the delivery sector, people are like working a lot because also I think we've been seeing how much under unpaid, uh, historically unpaid care work is something that actually is so heavy for people. And this work has been um, done historically by women in their households. And it, we know it's a trick of the capitalist system to really expropriate that force, the, the value from the care work in order to make profit, so profiting from it. And now we are in a moment, we, we, attain, we, we see that it's, it's so clear to many people that it's, it, is, it is work, obviously. And we, we should um, also recognize care work, the work that you do at home, cleaning the house, keeping your, um, you know, your kids safe and sane, keeping yourself safe and sane. This is this all takes a lot of time, and takes a lot of energy and resources. And therefore, I think uh, system change also goes fundamentally through the uh, acknowledgement, not only you know in our minds, but also acknowledgement in turn, in like giving the the the, the proper means for this work and recognizing that um, um, this that actually bases the entire what we call economy. So the economy is based on that. So I think in order to change that, we really need to acknowledge the power of the people who have been, you know, uh, working in those, you know, uh, as Steph said, in the health sector more and in, in so many sectors that we, that we just took, it, took for granted. Um, also in like care in the care economy, so in the in the places that you don't really have a formal job, but it is work anyways. So I think this is a economically speaking, maybe it is a very important um, thing to also um, change the relation and how we how we see work. Perfect answer. Thank you. 
And um, so because we are now pretty late, I would love to make uh, the last round. And um, because this evening we talked about a lot about how women have to step up and about how women should act and how important, important it is for us to act. Um, so maybe right now is also the time for the last minute uh, to talk about the men and to talk about how they can be our ally in this fight for feminism and climate justice. And so I think that, so for, uh, I get asked sometimes from men, so what, what, what can we do? How can we behave? Uh, how can I be a feminist too? Um, and sometimes I think it's, it's funny. Sometimes I think it's really sad. Um, but maybe it's helped. It's helping um, some men to understand um, what first step they can do to be our ally and to fight together the struggle for climate justice and feminism and for um, another sy system, a system of a justice society. And so our last round, I would love to make like, um, what advice would you give men Uh, how to change their behavior, which is also uh, imprinted on them from society, like toxic masculine behavior. Um, and well, again, Lara, I would love to start with you because sometimes I talk a lot with you about this topic. And I also think it's really interesting because we are from very different regions of the world um, to hear also your opinion. Um, so how how can if if a man like ask how can I change what can I do uh, what should could, could we answer them? Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to to thank you all because it's like so inspiring to listen to all of you. And um, I mean, on the one hand side, you could get super depressed listening to how all the problems are connected and interlinked. But at the same time, I think it's also great because like if we really want to stop the climate crisis and stop the climate injustices, then we have to overcome capitalism. We have to like overcome patriarchal system. And this is great because that's actually what we wanted to do anyways. So I think it's also a good thing that we have to work on it all like at the same time. And that also um, enables us to have a really broad movement fighting for it. Um, Yeah, that I just want to say as a positive note. And to all the, the guys, <laughs> I think you don't actually have to do that much. Like, it's so easy being a feminist. It, sometimes it just means to shut the fuck up and let others speak, for example. Or sometimes it just means to not get on a podium and instead suggest to, uh, for the organizers to invite a woman Or if they don't want to, um, I saw this, I don't even know where it was. I think it was actually a guy from Greenpeace or like from some climate um, NGO. And he was invited and um, he asked about it, like, um, do you really want to do like an all male panel? And isn't there any other um, experts that you could ask? And they said, no, no, um, there are no others. Uh, you should come. And then he was sitting on the stage and he said, okay, we were talking before and you said there are no other experts, but actually I know this woman, she's like a real expert in the field and I would like to swap places with her. And then he just left the stage and she came up. So it's sometimes really easy to just make space and let others speak. And I think this is the best thing that that guys could do or like all people who want to be fem feminist can do. And of course it clashes with our ego <laughs> and it's something that we can like encourage each other by just like as well as we have to val um, value care work and all this like invisible work I think also in activism we have to create a culture or in general in politics we have to create like an environment and a culture where all different sorts of work are actually valued and like pat each other on the shoulders also for doing like the background work that's hardly seen for Miriam doing the technical stuff today, for example. 
um, like pointing that out and um, valuing people for doing that um, because then it's maybe sometimes easier for, for um, guys to, to also do that and to make space for those who are like not heard enough to have a voice and to speak. Yeah. Thank you. So um, who's, who wants to go next or who has to share something else? Maybe from their experience in different level of, um, in different regions or in different level of, of activism or negotiations. Maybe I just want to share that, you know, men, you should always treat women you're equal. Because um, in this, uh, in this uh, kind of movement, they say like, oh, women are just so emotional. They're just overthinking it. They're just, uh, you know, um, incapable of doing something. I have heard of that, like, personally. So I don't... <laughs> Like, I, I don't think, like, I mean, hormone, I mean, practically speaking, like, um, women are emotional, but it should not be used against them. Like, uh, it should not be used against us. We are capable, more than capable. Um, so my message to men is like, treat women your equal. That is the best. Uh, for me, that is the best thing that you could do to support women, to treat them your equal. Yeah. Thank you. So, is there anyone who wants to add something more? Um, yes, I would want to add something. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, well, I agree with Lara and Marinelle about that, that um, men have to treat women equal. And also, if you are um, cautious about why women are not on a certain platform, at least ask for them or request that they be there. Because it all starts with um, what we do or what we have to say, because what we say is what makes other people stronger especially those who are going through certain circumstances. And in most cases, women bear the biggest burden, not only at home or care, home care, but also like other responsibilities. Uh, a woman is a very big figure in the, although most cases her capabilities are always underlooked, but women always have with them because it's in their nature that love comes up. So I think that men should also consider requesting for women's engagement and also participation, uh, not only in like home things, but also like in decision making and everything because they always give um, a very good point of view in making ideas or coming up with solutions to certain problems. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, you had your camera on for one minute. Okay, there I am. <laughs> um, yeah, I agree with you all, but I also think that we are talking about a system which has been there for centuries now. Um, so what I always say to my guy friends is like, um, actually, this is an active part to take in. Like also uh, for me to see the patriarchy, it also took some time to even like recognize these moments um, where patriarchy is, is coming in, swooshing in into our daily lives. And actually, um, it's kind of work to dismantle patriarchy. And you either 
try actively to dismantle it or you're upholding it. So I would also say this is something which is, cannot be like discussed once in your political group, for example, but has to be a constant progress. And also um, what I also wanted to mention is that uh, we have really touched the subject of queer feminism, for example. So this is only also a point where we have to, to see um, how can we get better in, in not only this binary female male thinking, but also like this gender fluidness and how we can be inclusive for every and all genders. Thank you so much. Um, so I would also love to, to thank all of you for to participate on this debate and to make your voices heard. And for me also, it's just, oh, is that, do you also wanted to add something or? <laughs> okay. Um, so for me, it's had such a huge discussion with so, uh, so many different levels. It's really hard to, to tackle the whole in, in two hours. So it's just also just the start and tomorrow we will continue with like different workshops and another panel. Um, and I hope to do more of these kinds of event, events uh, where we like pick out one special topic, so, uh, for example, queer feminism and climate justice, um, because also I, I love to talk about this issue as a queer person. Um, and so, so to, to start a discussion about it and to continue to talk to each other and like to create also like spaces where we can meet and um, maybe then have like in the future together projects or that our struggle are like, um, um, to say this, uh, that, that we start to grow together more and to learn from each other because when we are acting together, we, we are truly strong. Um, and then we, something can happen like the gender action plan at the UN climate negotiations, which was really, um, it was, for me, it was like amazing to, uh, to see how this can happen. And so sometimes it's like little steps, sometimes it's like huge steps, but that we are all uh, fighting to, to go into the right direction, even when it's sometimes really hard. And so I want to, to thank you all uh, for participating in our first panel. And I'm looking forward to hear from you again on our next panels or at the UN Climate Conference or at the protest or somewhere else. And I hope that you all guys stay healthy uh, over the winter and over the pandemic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you Thanks. so much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for organizing, Kathleen. Thank you. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And also thank thank you for for Miriam and Mike and, yeah. and yeah. the Arga team and the technic behind all the co the conference. Okay, see you soon. Thank you.